Hello, Namaskar. This is First Post and you're watching Vantage with me, Palki Sharma. Tonight, we lead with news of a terror attack in Kashmir. India has lost three brave hearts. Their stories are inspiring and heartbreaking. We'll talk about the events leading up to this attack, the clear Pakistani hand and the debate it has triggered in India about playing cricket with Pakistan. Meanwhile, people in Pakistan are talking about India's G20 success. We'll tell you what their leaders are saying. Also bringing you an exclusive interview with Union Minister, Minister Piyush Goel on India's G20 success, investments from China and trade talks with Canada. He says... They're on pause because of some serious concerns. We'll bring you that conversation. Are China and the European Union e e engaged in a trade war? Why Niger's junta has allowed the US military to resume operations but wants the French troops to leave? How politics is making the catastrophe in Libya worse? Anywhere between 5 and 20,000 people could be dead. There are multiple official estimates. In Mexico, the parliament is being shown alien corpses. And Gen Z is changing language and emails. Yours sincerely is dead. You don't want to miss this story? The headlines first. China central bank cuts the bank reserve ratio. This is to support its struggling economy. The reserve ratio is the amount of cash that banks must hold. It's the third time in the last few weeks that the central bank has cut a key rate. China is likely to release its economic data tomorrow. Taiwan lashes out at Elon Musk, says it is not up for sale. Taipei accuses the US tech billionaire of blindly flattering Beijing. Musk had said that the self-ruled island was an integral part of China. Beijing claims Taiwan as its own territory. Taiwan says Elon Musk should ask China why X is banned in the country. Is this the beginning of the end of the war in Yemen? Iran-backed Houthi rebels are set to fly to Saudi Arabia in their first publicly announced visit since 2015. Houthis had seized control of Yemen's capital, Sana'a, about a decade ago. This prompted a Saudi-led military intervention. A cruise ship remains stuck in remote Greenland. More than 200 people are on board this luxury ship. The ocean explorer ran aground. On Monday, above the Arctic Circle, the crew has twice attempted to get the ship afloat, but failed both times. And Iran wants to give Ronaldo a special SIM card. Tehran says it will allow the footballer internet access without curbs, but that's not something that most Iranians have. Ronaldo will travel to Tehran next week for a match. Tonight we start with a picture. It does not show politics or strategy or diplomacy. It shows human loss. It shows a father bidding farewell to his son. Take a look at this. These pictures are from Srinagar in Jammu and Kashmir. The father is Ghulam Hassan Bhatt. He retired as Inspector General of Jammu and Kashmir Police. He's already given his career to this country, but yesterday he gave up even more. His son was among three security officials killed in a terror attack. And this is how things unfolded. On Tuesday evening, security officials received a tip-off. Some terrorists were holed up in Anantnag, in the forests of Gadul. A joint team began operations. It comprised officers from the army and the police. On Wednesday morning, the team came under fire. Reports say it was an ambush. The terrorists positioned themselves strategically. The forest also gave them cover. So when the security team advanced, the terrorists fired incessantly. Three of the officers were injured. They were airlifted to the hospital, but by then it was too late. All three men succumbed to their injuries. Colonel Manpreet Singh, Major Ashish Dhonchak, and Deputy Superintendent of Police Humayu Bhatt. The picture we showed you was of his father. Their stories are inspirational, but also heartbreaking. Colonel Manpreet Singh had two young children, a six-year-old and a two-year-old. DSP Bhatt was also a father. His son is just 29 days old. By night on Wednesday, the operation was halted. 
It resumed earlier today. Kashmir police say they have encircled two, two Lashkar-e-Toyba terrorists in a building. The area has been cordoned off. Drones and helicopters have been deployed. Additional troops have also been rushed in. Now, the Lashkar-e-Toyba is a Pakistani terror group. It was founded by Hafiz Saeed, the same man who plotted the 2611 attacks in Mumbai. So once again, the park imprint is clear. The encounter in Anantnag is the second this week. The first one was in Rajori. Two terrorists were killed by the security forces there. Unfortunately, one soldier was also killed in action in Rajori. After the encounter, the area was combed. And what did they find? Large quantities of ammunition, also medicines with Pakistani markings. Like I said, the imprint is clear. These deaths have mobilized public opinion in India. There are calls to cut cricketing ties with Pakistan. As you know, the Asia Cup is underway. India could end up playing Pakistan in the final on Sunday. The World Cup is also coming up. Pakistan is expected to travel to India for the tournament. Right now, there are calls to cancel all of this. The Asia Cup, the World Cup and all cricketing ties, the BCCI, the Indian Cricket Board, is, has not reacted yet. But the anger on social media is palpable. Their argument is quite straightforward. Pakistani terrorists are killing our soldiers in Kashmir. How can we play cricket with that same country? The government is yet to wane. In the meantime, let's also look at the situation in Kashmir. Are things escalating there? Well, last month, there was a similar attack. Terrorists ambushed security officials near a forest. Three soldiers were killed. Both these attacks happened south of the Pir Panjal Mountains. Now, some quick facts. The Pir Panjal is part of the lower Himalayas. It is rugged with dense forests, which means it's the perfect hiding spot. Plus, the mountains are interconnected. You can venture out of the cover, carry out attacks, and then return to hide in the forest. Security officials say their next mission will focus on this mountain range. They want to drive terrorists out of the Pir Panjal. The recent attacks confirm this. Most of them did not happen in the Kashmir Valley. They happened in places south of the Pir Panjal, like Poonch, Rajori, and Anantnag. But beyond these pockets, the situation has improved. Like the terrorist recruitment numbers show, look at these numbers. It was 191 in, in 2020. 191 terrorists were recruited in 2020. This year it has come down to seven, just seven recruitments in nine months so far. In the same period, more than 600 terrorists have been neutralized. 86 of them were of, of foreign origin. So how many are left in Jammu and Kashmir? Well, we have figures from May this year. The government says there are 107 terrorists still operating in the Kashmir Valley, plus 15 in the Jammu region. Around 60% of them are foreign terrorists. Their masters in Pakistan have sensed the changing reality. Kashmir is making giant strides. Earlier this year, Srinagar hosted a G20 meeting. Since then, foreign tourism has picked up. Around 25,000 foreign tourists have arrived so far. Last year, it was around 20,000. Chances are more people will come for the Kashmir winter. Pakistan does not want this. They want to keep Kashmir pinned down with fear. Hence the recent attacks. We don't have much hope from the Pakistani establishment. But their people? Well, maybe all hope is not lost. Our next story will tell you why. The G20 summit, as you know, is over. But like a blockbuster movie, the reviews are still pouring in. And what's the verdict? It was certainly a must watch. You do have some holdouts like Ukraine and China, but broadly speaking, people are happy, even people in Pakistan. That's right. Ordinary people in Pakistan have reacted to India's G20. Those interviewed have great things to say. Some have praised India's economic growth. Others hailed India's political influence. But as expected, comparisons were drawn. Comparisons between India and Pakistan. I guess you cannot blame them. Both countries became independent at the same time. One is a G20 member. It is being quoted by all major powers in the world. And the other, living from one IMF bailout to another. So these reactions are expected. Listen in. The President of the US and the Saudi Crown Prince visited India for the summit. When the heads of the top 20 countries visit a country, it is an honor for that nation. The Indian economy will get many benefits out of this summit. We are trying to save our country from defaulting on loans. Meanwhile, India is hosting the 20 biggest economies. India has taken a great step. It was a great opportunity for the people of India. 
the people must be proud pakistan's foreign policy in the last 7 decades has failed our neighbor is hosting the biggest economies in the world but people here are not even aware of what's happening ordinary people do not have blinkers on they react to what they see and what they saw in new delhi was obvious india's economic and political power was in full display meanwhile pakistan was not even mentioned just think about it the g20 summit was all about the global south pakistan is part of the global south yet they had zero influence their government had nothing good to say about the summit in fact the leadership is salty this is what former pakistan prime minister nawaz sharif has said i'm quoting if the 2017 momentum was maintained pakistan would have been counted in the g20 and the summit the summit would have been hosted in pakistan now to give you some context 2017 is when nawaz sharif was ousted from power he says his government was doing well and if that work had continued pakistan would have entered the g20 not just entered they would have hosted the g20 that's what nawaz sharif claims do the facts check out though south africa is the smallest g20 economy their gdp is around 400 billion dollars what about pakistan around 370 billion dollars so there is distance to cover plus no prime minister in pakistan has ever completed their term so nawaz sharif is asking for the impossible really he's talking about a scenario that has never happened What about Pakistan's media what do they have to say well some things they got right let me quote from an editorial from the dawn newspaper where pakistan is concerned due to our internal issues we are largely spectators rather than active players in these transnational geo economic networks in simpler words we are irrelevant that's what they're saying i must say that's brutally honest but the same article also peddles some typical pakistani propaganda listen to this pakistan must also realize that despite india's atrocious human rights record in held kashmir the west as well as our muslim brothers seem least concerned and are eager to do business with delhi so the west is wrong the so called muslim brothers are also wrong india of course is wrong but only pakistan is right surely that cannot be the logical conclusion here the truth is pakistan's establishment must be fuming india has just hosted 43 world leaders the entire planet was being run from new delhi meanwhile pakistan cannot even host a cricket tournament that's how bad their security is but then again they have only themselves to blame pakistan's leadership used terror as a state policy and now you're seeing the returns home grown terrorists are attacking pakistani soldiers their former proxies are striking new friendships I'm talking about the Afghan Taliban. Pakistan helped them capture Kabul. Then Prime Minister Imran Khan asked the world to recognize the Taliban regime. But 2 years later, nothing has gone to plan. The Taliban are engaged in a border standoff with Pakistan. They're building outposts on Pakistani land. They're even mocking Pakistan's economy. So the Taliban is not taking Pakistan seriously. What about their Iran brother China? Well same story Beijing seems to have one up Islamabad in Kabul on Wednesday China named a new ambassador to Afghanistan they are the first country to do so to name an envoy in Afghanistan not even Pakistan has an ambassador in Kabul does this mean that China has recognized the Taliban regime well Beijing is not giving much away they're calling it normal diplomatic rotation whatever that means but these pictures are not easy to justify a chinese diplomat presenting his credentials to the taliban prime minister if this is not recognition we wonder what is so pakistan is pretty much losing the plot on their economy on their strategy and definitely their internal politics because when pakistanis say india got it right rest assured pakistan got something wrong Time for a vantage exclusive now. Last weekend India secured a major win on the world stage, a successful G20 summit with a joint statement that had 100% consensus. The negotiations went on into the wee hours. Many thought a joint declaration was impossible, but Indian diplomats made it happen. The question is how? How did India turn it around? We put this question to a key member of the Modi government who was in the thick of things India's commerce and industry minister Piyush Goel in an exclusive interview he spoke to me about India's negotiation strategy 
what other G20 members thought of India's presidency and how it will impact India's bilateral negotiations, especially on trade. Also, is India open to investments from China and why trade talks with Canada have been put on hold? We covered a lot of ground. Here's an excerpt from that conversation. Hello and welcome to this special interview. With me is Mr. Piyush Goel, Union Minister of India, or should I say Bharat, sir. Welcome to First Post. Thank you. Pleasure to be on your show, Palki ji. It's an honor to have you. Um, and let me start with a word of congratulations. India has uh, just closed its G20 presidency on a high, at least the leaders' summit. And uh, we had everyone, all sides, agree to a joint statement. Uh, you have passed a cabinet resolution uh, uh, hailing the success of the G20. Are you satisfied with the outcomes? It truly is very, very satisfying, very, very encouraging to see the trust that India during its G20 presidency has been able to earn from leaders across all sides of the fence. Very different viewpoints were on offer. It was a difficult time. Most people had given up hope on an outcome document. I think it was a very deft handling on the part of the Honorable Prime Minister and the team which was working on it. And clearly a matter of great satisfaction that what we had set out to achieve when the presidency came to India, making it a people's G20, Jan Bhagyadari, get everybody involved, get the nation feel connected to an important event like this, and come up with outcomes which demonstrate to the world that India cares, cares for not only our 140 crore Indians, but for the entire world. I think that message has gone down very, very strongly from this presidency. Yes, and like I was telling you, uh, the, the Brazilian president, Brazil is the next chair, and they said they're taking lessons from India. You mentioned Jan Bhagidari. It truly was a people's event. And the people have one question in mind. How did you make it happen? You, were, you served as the G20 Sherpa in 2021. Um, and while we see the decisions come out, we're all curious to know what goes into you know, forging that consensus, how do you achieve something like this? You know, when we got the presidency on 1st of December last year, the situation was somewhat like what we hear of uh, in the Charles Dickens book, A Tale of Two Cities. On the one hand, the times were good. On the other hand, the times were full of despair, difficult times. And the situation was challenging. We had barely come out of COVID. The war was still raging on. The East and the West were highly polarized, divided. And clearly, the G20 was addressing the challenges of a broken world order. At that point of time, for India to present such an ambitious agenda, which talked about the entire world coming together, which talked about the world addressing the needs of a long awaited better deal for the less developed countries, the developing countries, particularly in the global south. A world which was looking for inclusive and sustainable solutions, yet was conscious that it's a very, very different uh, level of development that we see in different parts of the world, which means we have to be more accommodative, we have to try and come up with balanced and equitable solutions. So there were a lot of challenges. And in some sense, you get the best out of Prime Minister Modi when there's a challenge on hand. And we saw that happening in the G20. He led from the front. He was uh, really on the front foot through the Indian G20 presidency. 
how does the Delhi declaration and the conversations you've had over, especially over the past few days, uh, how does it impact India's bilateral engagements with partners, especially uh, on trade? Uh, because we've seen a lot of focus on trade deals lately and uh, over the weekend we saw two in particular, the UK and, and Saudi Arabia. Which are the areas or regions we're focusing on to, to push for deals like these? I think the biggest uh, achievement of the entire G20 presidency has been trust. Bilateral trading arrangements or economic partnerships that we are pursuing with the UK, also with the EU, the 27 nation bloc of EU, who is our second largest trading partner after the United States. We also were in a dialogue with Canada, which uh, for some time we are looking at to kind of, we've given it a pause to see how we need to take it forward going forward. Why is that, if I may ask? There are several reasons uh, we need to make sure that geopolitically and economically we are all on the same page. And therefore, the pause on the Canada discussions. Are we not on the same page with Canada? We are on good page, but uh, we have had certain issues which are of serious concern. Uh, they have been highlighted in the bilateral meeting that the Honorable Prime Minister had with the Prime Minister of Canada. And we are hoping for resolution of some of these issues before we take it forward. So you will see that we have a very vast array of negotiations underway. In fact, most teams in the Commerce Ministry are actually doing two shift working, a morning negotiation with one and another in the evening. And you really need to be very sharply focused on each negotiation because you are crystal gazing into 30, 40, 50 years into the future. Is India open for business for Chinese investors? Well, India is open for business for all investors across the world. We are fair to all countries. We would only like to make sure that we get reciprocal uh, access, reciprocal benefits. We'd like to make sure that strategically India's interests are not compromised. And therefore, India is a little cautious when it comes to investments from all our land bordering countries, uh, whether it's China or any other land bordering country, we are uh, looking at a little more cautious, calibrated approach. The world is looking at diversifying supply chains and most international companies are uh, adopting a policy of China plus one, uh, which is seen as an opportunity for India. And at the same time, there are other players like Thailand and Vietnam. They offer similar deals, similar advantages. They're vying for the same market. What is India's strategy? Frankly, China plus one is a very popular terminology. Then you have anything but China. Then you have French shoring and near shoring. All of these uh, have been in public domain for quite some time now. And I do recognize that India also benefits when people are looking for trusted partners, looking for rules-based transparent uh, economic systems where they feel confident that they and safer also. No Indian businessman disappears in the middle of the night uh, for months and then comes out as a professor. But uh, I think today and more particularly after this G20 presidency, India has changed the rules of the game. The narrative is now very much different. India on its own stream. India on its own legs today goes with a, from a position of strength, with self-confidence and engages with the rest of the world, invites investments, invites businesses to come and work in India. And I think it will no more be a, a diversification strategy. It will not necessarily be only about resilient supply chains. India will now become a compulsive destination. India will become the need of the hour. More and more companies are recognizing that the democracy, the demographic dividend, and the diversity, the three Ds that India offers, we have become an aspirational society, a young aspirational India which is going to drive and power India on its own stream. We will become the, the pole around which world economies will want to work and engage.
Thank you very much, sir, for taking all the questions and for all your time and for sharing your perspectives with us. And once again, congratulations. Thank you very much, Palkiji. Speaking of trade, the European Union is on the brink of a trade war with China. And the stakes could not be higher. China is the second largest economy in the world. The EU is the third largest. A trade war between them could be disastrous. So what is the flashpoint? electric cars or EVs, electric vehicles. Europe says China is flooding their market with cheap electric vehicles. How? By giving subsidies. As a result, European firms cannot keep up. They're losing sales and market share to China. Brussels is looking to correct this. On Wednesday, the EU chief announced an investigation into Chinese EVs. Listen to this. Global markets are now flooded with cheaper Chinese electric cars. And their price is kept artificially low by huge state subsidies. This is distorting our market. And as we do not accept this distortion from the inside in our market, we do not accept this from the outside. So I can announce today that the Commission is launching an anti-subsidy investigation into electric vehicles coming from China. It's a huge announcement, and I'll give you two reasons why. Number one, the European industry did not complain. So the decision to investigate China came from Brussels, not companies, not industry executives. And reason number two, this could snowball into a trade war. If the findings are negative, the findings of this investigation, if they're negative, Brussels could impose more tax on Chinese EVs. Of course, China will respond in kind. You could very well have a tariff war between China and the European Union. Beijing has slammed this anti-subsidy investigation. They're calling it protectionism. What I want to emphasize is that the investigation measure that the European Union plans to take is to protect its own industry in the name of fair competition. This is blatant protectionist behavior that will seriously disrupt and distort the global automotive industrial chain and supply chain, including the European Union. So what's the full story here? China is the largest EV producer in the world. They make up 8% of all electric vehicles sold in Europe. It could reach 15%, 1.5, by 2025. 15%. What explains this trend? Europe is known for its top-class auto industry. So why are Europeans buying from China? Because the EVs are cheaper around 20% less expensive than EVs made in Europe. Chinese cars are 20% cheaper, and that is a big difference. Brussels is investigating how that difference is possible. China says it's technology and skill. But the European Union is not convinced. They think it has to do with state subsidies like tax cuts or cheap land or low raw material prices. The investigation will take around 13 months. If China has tinkered with the market, then there will be tariffs. Right now, the EU imposes a 10% tax on Chinese electric vehicles. The US imposes around 27%. So Europe does have some wiggle room. But is there merit to their claim? Local authorities in China still offer subsidies to EV makers. In fact, Beijing was warned about this. Let me introduce you to NIO, a Chinese automaker based in Shanghai. The founder of NIO sounded the alarm back, back in April. He said Chinese EV makers should brace for the possibility of tariffs. He also explained why. Apparently, Chinese EV makers have a cost advantage. Take battery prices, for example. In China, that's around $130 per kilowatt hour. Outside China, it's $151 or thereabouts. Beijing has been pumping in subsidies to prop up this sector. In six years, they have spent $57 billion, and this helps all Chinese, all car makers, in fact both Chinese ones, like BYD, and foreign makers, like Tesla, who run their factories out of China. But the end beneficiary is Beijing. So there is merit to Europe's claim. Yet two questions remain. Number one, why haven't European companies complained about this? Because they're scared of China. A German auto association says the EU must be mindful of a backlash from Beijing. So they want the EU to focus on other things like lowering electricity prices or reducing government hurdles. Basically, they're telling the EU, do not pick a fight. And the reason is quite simple. China is a huge market for European cars, for European car makers. 
they don't want to risk a trade war. And question number two, if the companies are not complaining, why is the European Union complaining? Because of jobs. Europe's auto industry employs 13 million people. That's 7% of all European jobs in the auto industry. Now imagine European automakers cannot compete with China. What will they do? As they say, if you can't beat them, you join them. So European companies could end up shifting base to China and Brussels is trying to avoid that to ensure that the automakers and the jobs stay within Europe. That's the financial side of things. But you can't ignore the politics. China's support for Russia has ruffled a lot of feathers in Brussels. Most European nations see Beijing as a threat now. In that context, this investigation is not a surprise. It's just a natural course of action. But the bigger worry is this. Bigger economies are embracing protectionism. Like America, last year Joe Biden passed the Inflation Reduction Act. It calls for massive EV subsidies. If you buy certain electric vehicles, you get tax breaks worth more than $7,500. Just one condition. The EV must be made in North America. That's the US, Mexico and Canada. The European Union criticized that decision as well. They called it discriminatory. So EVs promise to be political lightning rods in the future. Many believe it's the future of the auto industry. And if that is the case, every country will try to capitalize. Countries like Japan and Germany have built their economies around fuel cars. EVs could offer a similar opportunity. Now let's turn our attention to West Africa. It's been an eventful week in Niger. The country was hit by a coup in the month of July, and now the junta is in charge. They seem to be employing two tax tactics against the West, almost like a carrot and stick approach. The carrot is, is reserved for the US and the American military operations in the country. The stick is for France. Now before the coup, Niger was working with a host of Western nations like France, Germany, Italy and the US. All of them had a military presence in Niger. The US has more than 1,000 soldiers in the country. They worked with other foreign troops and Niger's military. They fought terrorists in Africa's Sahel region. But on the 26th of July, all of this stopped. That's when the coup was announced. President Mohamed Bazoum was removed from power. He was imprisoned by Niger's new military leaders. So what did these foreign troops do, the foreign troops deployed in Niger, what did they do when the coup happened? Most of them stayed put in their bases. But that is changing now. Reports say American soldiers are back in action. They have resumed their activities in Niger. The U.S. has apparently reached some sort of an understanding with the junta. So U.S. troops are back to conducting drone and crewed missions. Last week, the Pentagon had put out this statement. There is no perceived threat uh, in terms of any threat to U.S. troops um, and no threat of violence on the ground. This is simply a precautionary measure. So what we're doing right now is the department is repositioning some of our personnel and some of our assets from Air Base 101 in Niamey to Air Base 201 in Agadez. There was no perceived threat. The U.S. troops just left Niger's capital, Niamey. They relocated to what's known as Air Base 201. This is in the center of Niger. And now the Americans are conducting intelligence and surveillance missions from here. They're back to tracking terrorists. But France has a different story to tell. France is in the line of fire of Niger's junta. And they're adamant. They say the French must leave their country. French troops must go. In fact, this has been the call since the coup took place in July. Niger has seen numerous demonstrations against France. French flags have been burnt. The French ambassador in Niger has been asked to leave. He hasn't yet. There are 1,500 French soldiers in the country. They're stationed in a military base near the capital, Niamey, and there have been regular protests outside this French military base with calls for the soldiers to leave. Despite all of this, France has stuck around. Last week, Niger's junta said they were given some assurances. They were apparently told that the French troops would be redeployed and there would be some withdrawal. But the junta voiced concerns on Sunday. It should be pointed out to national and international public opinion that since the announcement of this withdrawal plan, France has continued to deploy its forces in several ECOWAS countries as part of the preparations for an aggression against Niger.
that it is planning in collaboration with this community organization. The CNSP and the transitional government denounce and castigate this lack of sincerity. These underhand, delaying tactics are designed to dull the patriotic ardor of the Niger people in their fight for the total withdrawal of French troops from Niger. Niger's junta called France's tactics insincere and underhanded. When asked about the junta statement, this is what French President Emmanuel Macron said. A coup since last July has been holding hostage a democratically elected president. France has a simple position. We are condemning it. We are demanding the release of President Bazoum and the rehabilitation of the constitutional order. We do not recognize any legitimacy in the statements of Putschists. President Bazoum has not renounced to his power and so if we ever redeploy, I would do so only at the request of President Bazoum and in coordination with him, not with those responsible today for holding a president hostage. While all this was happening, more trouble was brewing in Niamey. Niger's junta arrested a French official last Friday. He was a counsellor for French citizens abroad, elected by the French citizens in Niger to represent their interests. The French Ministry of Foreign Affairs issued an alert on Tuesday. They demanded his release. The next day, the official was set free. This arrest had the potential to cause an escalation, but it seems Niger's junta did not want that. The arrest may have just been a warning, a reminder to France that things could get worse. So how will Paris react to this? Will Macron finally agree to leave or will the move strengthen his resolve to stay? We'll find out in the days to come. In the U.S., the death of an Indian student has led to a major controversy. A new video is out. It exposes the apathy of the American police. This case dates back to January. It involves a 23-year-old Indian student. Her name was Janvi Kandula. She was in Seattle in the United States. She was hit by a police car, a police patrol car. The officer behind the wheel hit her. Another officer responded. Do you know how? By joking about it about the value of her life. He said, the city will write a check for this loss. The body cam footage has emerged. It shows how crass the police response was. It has triggered a strong backlash. American authorities have launched an investigation. India has expressed concern. Our next report tells you more. Janvi Kandula arrived in Seattle in 2021. She had just left her hometown of Bengaluru. She was pursuing her master's in the US. Like any other immigrant student, she had big dreams. But it all came crashing down on the 23rd of January. Janvi was at the intersection of Dexter Avenue North and Thomas Street. She was crossing the street. That's when she was hit by a car. Not just any car, it was a police patrol car. Behind the wheel was Seattle officer Kevin Dave. The body cam footage of this incident has been released. In the video, one can hear a loud roar from the engine. The speedometer shows that the car was going at 119 kilometers per hour. According to the police, Kevin was responding to a high-priority call. He should have been sounding the car's siren, but according to officials, he wasn't doing it consistently. Kevin hit the brakes just a second before it hit Janvi. The car at that moment was going at 101 kilometers per hour. So Janvi was flung far away by the impact, almost 100 feet away from the spot. She was taken to Harborview Medical Center. That's where she succumbed to her injuries. Officials have been deliberating whether to charge the officer. So they sent a Seattle Police Department union leader, Daniel Orderer. Daniel is a drug recognition expert, so he was asked to examine whether Kevin was impaired. Daniel, too, was wearing a body cam. He later called the Guild president, Mike Solon. He was supposed to report what happened, but these were his comments. First. He laughed about the incident. Uh, I think she went up on the hood, hit the windshield, then when he hit the brakes, flew off the car. But she is dead. <laughs> then he said Janvi's life had limited value and then added that the city should just write a check for $11,000. That's all he thought her life was worth. Yeah, just write a check. Just... 
$11,000. She was 26 anyway. She had limited value. Daniel says his comments were taken out of context. He says his remarks were intended to mimic how the city's attorneys might react to the death. But the comments have led to widespread backlash, from Indian Americans to lawmakers. Everyone has slammed the incident. So what is the United States doing about it? The Indian consulate has raised the issue, asking for action against those involved. The US government has since swung into action. An investigation is currently underway. In a letter to the Kandula family, the Seattle city mayor says the comments were of just one person and that it doesn't reflect the feelings of the city. While the death of Janvi is a tragic incident, this isn't a singular event. It's a stark reflection of the issues plaguing US law enforcement. This incident highlights the pressing need for greater accountability, more transparency and reform within the police force. The U.S. needs to ensure that tragedies like this are not only prevented, but also met with the seriousness they deserve. More than 5,000 people dead, at least 10,000 missing, 300,000 people affected, entire neighborhoods leveled, many washed out into the sea, electricity and communication lines downed, hospitals and morgues overwhelmed bodies left piled up on the streets. This is the scale of destruction in Libya. It is vast and catastrophic. Torrential rain hit the North African country this past weekend, leading to floods in its northeastern region. By then, the situation was bad, but the worst damage came when the floods burst to dams. This was near the coastal city of Derna. It caused waters to move with terrible ferocity and speed. They ravaged eastern Libya. Now a quarter of Derna has been completely erased and several other cities have been affected. Then we heard that the dam had burst and the water had flooded the area. People were asleep and no one was ready. We lost 30 people so far, 30 members of the same family. We have not found anyone. The worst of the horror is far from over. Officials are still taking stock of the situation. The Civil Aviation Ministry says at least 5,300 deaths have been recorded. The Health Ministry says about 6,000 people have died. Meanwhile, the mayor of Derna says 10 to 20,000 people could be dead. And this should give you an idea of the sheer lack of clarity here. The coordination between government officials is poor, to say the least. One can blame damaged infrastructure for this. But that is not the biggest roadblock. That is not the biggest problem of Libya. Libya's political landscape is to blame for what's happening, for how its people are suffering. This country has been battered by more than a decade of conflict. Political rivalry has laid waste to Libya's state services. Now this country has two governments, two rival governments. One in the capital Tripoli, the one that the world recognizes, and another controlling the country's east, led by rival political factions supported by the military two separate governments. The flooding happened in eastern Libya. Floods are ripping through eastern Libya, so they are the eastern government's problem, the one supported by the military. But it's a very big problem. It requires efforts from both sides. On paper, the government in Tripoli says it has provided aid, but the eastern government says it has not. And they need support from Tripoli because the international community recognizes only the government in Tripoli, in the capital. All the aid comes to the capital. If it is not passed on to the east, then people will suffer. They are suffering. There is no denying that the coordination is poor and this has resulted in slow rescue efforts. It's been three days since the calamity struck Libya and it's only now that there are some signs of a thaw. Reports say last night a ministerial delegation left Tripoli. They went to Derna and other, other nearby cities to assess the damage. International assistance has finally started reaching those who needed the most. Around 11 countries are sending aid or rescue teams. And here's something else that you should know. This disaster would not have been so bad had it not been for this power politics. I told you about the two dams near Derna that broke. These dams were aging and Derna does not share good relations with either government, neither in the East nor in Tripoli. So this city, Derna, has got no support. It has faced long years of neglect. 
Also, the Libyan floods could have been predicted. They were caused by a storm. The storm was gradually approaching the nation, but authorities did not take any action. They did not study the water levels. They did not prepare an evacuation plan. If they would have been a normally operating meteorological service, uh, they could have issued the warnings and, uh, and, and also the emergency management authorities would have been able to carry out evacuation of the, of the people and we could have lost, uh, avoided most of the human, human casualties. All of this is happening because there is no central authority in Libya, no one to shore up infrastructure, no one to draw up plans to save people, no one to take responsibility. Now there is fury and grief. The people of Libya feel abandoned. And while those in power have failed to help, locals and volunteers are stepping up. People from West Libya are coming to the east. They're supporting the affected population. They're sharing vital supplies like food, water and first aid. They're helping dig up victims from the debris. They're pulling people from the sea. They're helping bury the dead. It's bad enough to be stuck with one failing government. It's worse to be caught between two. Our thoughts and prayers are with the people of Libya. We talk about politics every night on the show. Some of those events and stories are so bizarre, they seem otherworldly. But this one in Mexico truly takes the cake. The Mexican Congress held a hearing, their first hearing on unidentified anomalous phenomena, a.k.a. UFOs. They were talking about aliens. And they put two corpses on display. According to them, these were alien corpses with elongated heads and three fingers on each hand. Now, if you've grown up watching movies like E.T., these corpses may look very familiar to you. They look exactly like the aliens shown in movies. So did Hollywood get it right? Is it time for a meet and greet with our otherworldly neighbors? Our next report tells you all about Mexico's extraterrestrial extravaganza. What do you think the politicians of a country discuss, especially in parliament? Well, you'd expect things like policies, healthcare, even education. But Mexico's Congress seems to have taken a break from national issues to dive headfirst into the paranormal. Mexico's Congress gathered to discuss the ever-elusive topic of UFOs. But quickly, one thing became apparent. This wasn't your average committee meeting. The star attraction? Alien corpses. Yes, you heard that right. Bodies of extraterrestrial guests were put on display. All for the world to see. This is the first time this evidence presented during the hearing is presented in such a form and I think there is a clear demonstration that we are dealing with non-human specimens that are not related to any other species in our world and that any scientific institution can investigate it. Does that mean aliens are real? Well, let's not jump to conclusions just yet. This could just be a case of mistaken identity. I mean, take the corpses for example. They have elongated heads, three fingers in each hand. At first glance, they're very similar to aliens that you see in movies. The bodies were allegedly found in Peru in 2017. And according to Mexico, they're about 1,000 years old. The aliens were displayed by this man, Jaime Mossan. He's a self-proclaimed ufologist and journalist. His theories have been debunked before, but he clearly doesn't give up. And while the aliens landed in the Congress, there were no saucer-shaped UFOs hovering over the building, or even any bright green invaders. Either way, the session was an unprecedented one. It took place two months after a similar one before the US Congress. Both sides debated whether aliens were real. But Mexico seems to have taken it one step further. It brought evidence and how. Which brings us to the question, are aliens real? Well, scientists have already debunked these claims. They call it a fraud. The Congress too hasn't taken a position on the issue. They're just listening to evidence. So while aliens may not be real, this session certainly delivers on entertainment value. Mexico's Congress has successfully blended politics with sci-fi and humour. But it leaves many with one burning question. Are we alone in the universe? And if we're not, why have aliens ditched their favourite destination, America, for its southern neighbour? Is Mexico now their new favourite country? Well, who knows? Maybe like all of us, aliens also prefer tacos, tequila and abortion rights.
Slay, serve, survive. Lukewarm regards. Hasta la pasta. No, I'm not glitching. I'm simply sharing email sign-offs written by the young workers of today. For most of the world, Gen Z speak may as well be parcel tongue. You know, the language of serpents from Harry Potter, parcel tongue. Gen Z seem to have a language of their own, which not only transforms one day and one reel at a time, but it is killing off the good old OG work buzzwords. A new Barclays survey is out. It says 71% workers believe the young are changing the language of the workplace. 41% say yours truly is dying. 36% say yours sincerely has been given a death sentence. Now when a bank says that formal corporate lingo is dying, you know that something is up. Here's a report. To whom it may concern, RIP. No, this isn't meant for you. We're speaking to the formal work phrase, to whom it may concern. It seems to be dying a slow death. And young workers would rather give up on a day of TikTok than resuscitate it. Because they have said hasta la pasta to traditional email phrases. Instead, they write jargon like alright, alright, alright or slay, serve, survive. Some don't even expend that much creative energy. They'd rather be direct, so they write lukewarm regards. Please hesitate to reach out. Or, if you have any questions, please ask someone else. It's brutal for sure, but the trend is taking over. It's happening, people. Formalities in workplace language are due for retirement. And a bank says so. A bank. What are we talking about? Friends, Romans and Boomers, lend us your ears. A new survey is out. It was conducted by Barclays. It says three quarters of workers believe Gen Z is changing language in the workplace. They say commonly used expressions at work could be lost from offices within a decade. Which words are the worst hit? Take your pick. 41% of people say yours truly is dying. 36% claim yours sincerely is reaching its end. 35% say to whom it may concern has been given a death sentence. Terms like with compliments and respects are bidding goodbye too. Question is, why is this happening? Obviously, the answer has everything to do with Gen Z. More and more youngsters are joining the workforce. According to the World Economic Forum, by 2025, Gen Z will account for one-third of the workforce, meaning the way they communicate affects corporate jargon. Reports say employees aged between 18 and 24 are twice as likely to use instant messaging compared to the older generations, especially the 50-plus. And texting, by its very nature, is more casual. This has a spillover effect for emails. So old-fashioned phrases have become a casualty to this casualness. Young workers also have a greater desire to show their personality during workplace exchanges, like email messaging. Think about emojis or GIFs. That's what colleagues often use while chatting with each other. And what better way to incorporate fun into emails than infuse it with email sign-offs? Of course, this doesn't work for everyone. Not all email receivers want to stay real or keep it groovy. So for them, maybe it's good to take a look at the bigger picture. Creative email sign-offs are a sign of the times. It also relieves you from crippling fear of finding the right words. Should an email end with best regards or thanks or yours truly? Should it begin with dear or hey? People are free to make the choice. Yours truly, first post. Wait, scratch that. First post out. Now it's time for Vantage Shots, images that tell the story. What do you do when you get a new car? You definitely show it off to your friends. Well, world leaders are no different. Russian President Vladimir Putin invited North Korean leader Kim Jong-un to check out his Russian-made limousine. In the United States, a furry fugitive led the police on a wild chase. The pet lemur had escaped from its home, but it was later caught. And soon you could be flying to hospitals. An Israeli startup is testing its flying taxi for a quick ride to the hospital. Finally, we are also taking you back in history. On this day in 1960, Iraq, Iran, Kuwait, Saudi Arabia and Venezuela founded the oil cartel OPEC.
The Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, OPEC. In the next two decades, OPEC restructured the global system of oil production. Currently, the OPEC accounts for 30% of global oil production. We're leaving you with that. Thank you for watching. We'll see you tomorrow. We got this Frenchie! <laughs>